Happy Teach Me Tuesday. My name is Lisa Houston. I am a NICU-based clinical educator. Uh, today is the second Tuesday of May, and during the month of May, we are doing our neck deep dive because it is Neck Awareness Month. Today, we are going to talk about some things that are a little bit more um, controllable for us as NICU nurses, including resuscitation and vital signs in the first days of life. Last week, we talked about things that we as bedside NICU nurses don't have that much control over. And that's what's going on with mom during pregnancy, how it affects the placenta, and then how that blood flow of the placenta to the baby affects the risk of neck. But today we're going to talk about resuscitation and vital signs. So when we think about neck, right, we really think about this inflammatory process that damages the intestinal lining, it can lead to necrosis, death of the intestines. We don't know exactly what causes that because I assure you, if we knew the one thing or the three things that cause neck, we would stop doing them, right? But we haven't figured out exactly what it is because it is multifactorial. There's many things such as the immature immune response, the altered gut microbiome, the in utero blood flow changes, the ischemia that causes is caused at resuscitation or immediately after resuscitation or in the first few days of life. So if we think about, hey, if we can have a really effective resuscitation where the baby's heart rate and saturations are stable the whole time, and then when they're in the NICU, if we can keep their temperature and their blood pressure and their perfusion good, we're going to reduce the risk of neck. So if we talk about resuscitation and specifically preventing hypoxia and hypoperfusion, we are going to decrease the baby's risk for neck. So effective resuscitation, if you remember back to NRP, the single most important step of resuscitation is ventilation. So ventilation is going to get that oxygen into the baby's blood and effectively spread it throughout the body. We know our ventilation is effective because of rising stable heart rates. When you have a stable heart rate, that means your cardiac output is good and you're going to perfuse the whole body. These babies may come out already depressed. Maybe you're at a delivery because mom's had prolonged um, rupture of membranes and there's not a great area for of amount of fluid in the lungs for the baby's you know, lungs to grow because there's just nothing in utero. Maybe the mom had a maternal hemorrhage and we've had a decreased blood volume. Therefore, there's not enough circulating to the baby. So when the baby comes out, we want to correct those things as quickly as we can. We know that we follow the NRP algorithm to tell us about how, what level of oxygen the baby should be at for their oxygenation via their saturations during resuscitation. And so we are going to adjust to that. Meanwhile, also watching for their perfusion levels. During resuscitation, we want to get that effective resuscitation that gets our respiratory distress out of there. We get the baby nice and stable. We don't want the baby to be hypothermic. And then we can control those two things during resuscitation. We are going to lower the baby's risk of developing neck because we have supported their health. Thermoregulation is so key. Cold babies, if you read any literature about neck and it's talking about hypothermia, hypothermia at delivery and in the first few days of life is a factor when you kind of look at, hey, what was going on with the baby? It will, It is one of the most frequent things that comes up for babies that have severe neck. So those babies that require surgery, surgical neck. So then you take this thermoregulation into the NICU. So the way that we're dealing with that, with delivery and the golden hour, is we're increasing the temperature of the delivery room, we're pre-warming the table, we're using warming mattresses for babies under 28 weeks or 1,000 grams, whatever your policy may be, using a polyurethane cover, maybe a poncho, getting that temperature probe on right away so that we're making sure we're not making them hypo hyperthermic and watching our hypothermia. We don't want any of those major swings, high or low. So we get the baby to the NICU, right? We want to get the top of the incubator closed and get our humidity started as soon as possible. We want to get our positioning devices in. We want to close the top. We want to leave the top closed. If you have worked somewhere that has incubators that the top comes up and down. We want to get those babies out skin to skin so that with when they are with their parents, they can be warm and um, having normal thermia. Evidence tells us that for every degree the baby drops below 36, their mortality increases by 28%. Like, let that sink in. That's a big deal. The 36 degrees Celsius isn't that big of a, 
jump, right? When you really think about it. And so if they get that low, their risk of death is very high. So it is key that we keep them warm. So it's cold stress refers to this condition where the baby loses more heat than it can generate. So if you think about that in relation to neck and temperature, those are things that we're thinking about like, hey, this baby got so cold that they had to shunt blood away from their intestines to their other vital organs in order to stay warm. We, in my facility and in my previous facilities, we will do swarms where we're kind of looking at all the evidence we have in front of us for infants that have severe neck, so those surgical infants. And looking at their temperatures at delivery and in the first few hours of life can tell us a lot about what their risk factor was for neck. Even if the baby's a few weeks old, we will go through and see if we can identify any recorded episodes of temperature that were really low during the baby's stay. So things that contribute to the baby getting cold. We know they have limited fat stores. So that just means they don't have insulation, they can't have heat retention, and they can have rapid heat loss. They have underdeveloped ability in their immature systems to regulate their body temperature. So every time we open the tap or we open the portholes or we keep the portholes open for long periods of time or we drop the side down, we are just exposing them to more um, temperature changes. And then that large surface area of compared to their body weight increases the potential for heat loss through the skin. So they've got all these predisposing factors. So what we need to be doing as bedside nurses is saying, how can I help keep your temperature stable? How can I make sure that we're in the right amount of humidity, that we have you on skin servo mode set at the right temperature so that you don't get so cold that you have to shunt the blood away just to try to get it to the core so that you can keep warm. These are key when you really put it together with neck. When you think about a baby saturation, so we're talking about vitals in the NICU, right? First we talked about resuscitation, then we talked about temperature at delivery, temperature in the NICU and the importance of that, what we are monitoring, and now we're talking about saturations. So low oxygen saturations can lead to reduced oxygen delivery to the intestines. So just like all these other things. So that increases the risk of ischemia. It's just pretty much that simple. <laughs> I mean, it's not, but it is. You know, ischemia is, can, can damage the mucosa increases your inflammation. Inflammation causes the mucosa to not be able to come out. So then you don't have this um, protection in the lining and then bacteria invades and then you have neck. So these fluctuations, even if you call it swinging or drifting, whatever you're calling it in your NICU, all those times where maybe the saturations are low, this makes the organs vulnerable to inadequate tissue oxygenation. So profound or severe hypoxia, I think about when babies have maybe an unplanned extubation or a clog in their tube or maybe a PDA, maybe they just have prolonged periods of desaturations, it can compromise their cellular function and contribute to neck. So it's a pretty big deal along with blood pressure. So blood pressure, I feel like, feels more kind of like straightforward, you know, if you are hypotensive, right? Low blood pressure. You have a low circulating blood volume. And again, we're going to pull that blood away from those non-vital organs, non-vital as I call them, your intestines, maybe your kidneys, maybe your liver, so that your heart, lungs, and brain have enough blood flow. So lower blood pressure reduces the delivery of oxygen to the intestines. Blood pressure changes can contribute to increased gut permeability, so then bacteria and toxins get across the barrier and trigger an inflammatory response. Fluctuations in blood pressure may also disrupt the gut biome. So that can lead to dysbiosis, which is an uneven amount of bacteria in the um, intestines. So all of these are increasing the risk for neck because of the compromised blood flow to the intestines. So it's kind of a big deal. So temperature, saturations, or blood pressure are three things that we as bedside nurses can really be paying attention to, watching for micro changes, making sure we're not over treating something. So if they're having low saturations, increasing their oxygen slowly. If they're having high satura saturations, decreasing their oxygen slowly. If their blood pressures are low, making sure we're doing slow incremental changes to bring it back up. Watching for peen, 
peeing is a huge sign that your blood pressure is at a good place. If your kidneys are functioning well, it is typically a good sign that your intestines are functioning well. Whenever a baby stops peeing for me, that is when I get concerned. To me, that means the perfusion is compromised enough that the kidneys are no longer getting it. I can only imagine what happened to the gut. So if that's a key takeaway for you, watch your urine output. So what can we tell our parents? We need to talk to them about thermoregulation. Getting them out holding skin to skin is going to be so important. Spoiler alert for next week about the importance of kangaroo care and how it affects the baby and can help prevent neck. Let's tell them about slow changes in positioning, right? We don't wanna just be moving the baby around. That can really affect their temperature regulation, their blood pressure, as we just talked about. Using portholes for skin or care time so we're not dropping the sign down every time or popping the top. I remember popping the top all the time. And now when I see it happening, it's such a rarity. You're like, okay, there must be like something really happening. And yes, most of those incubators have a warming lamp, but it's not the same. And you lose the humidity if your baby is on it. And then alerting the staff to changes in vitals or notice a change in perfusion is also going to be important. So vital signs and thermoregulation during resuscitation and while in the NICU are things that we can do to help prevent neck. Having checklists for deliveries. What's your delivery room temperature? Do you have the right equipment you need there? For a golden hour, what are we doing when the baby first comes down? When are we starting humidity? When are we getting our positioning devices in? These things, making sure that our blood pressure and our saturation stay within normal range are things that we can do to help mitigate the risk of neck. If a baby has a perfect blood pressure and a perfect temperature and perfect saturations their entire stay, they still might get neck. And that's because some of the things we can't control and then maybe some other things that we're going to talk about in the next coming weeks. But the more we can do to lower their risk, the better the outcomes are going to be. So thank you for joining me this week for this Teach Me Tuesday. We have two more Tuesdays in May where we are going to talk about neck and kind of connect it to a few other things. So I hope you'll join me. Make sure you are subscribed. Please share these videos with your friends. I love trying to make them under 15 minutes so people can watch them on their uh, or even just listen to me on their drive into work. Uh, the highest form of flattery is for you to share these with your friends. So thank you so much and have a great Tuesday.